Brian Langley here to preach for us this morning. I think I've said all the good things I can say about him already, so I'm not going to give any more introduction. Just come on up, brother, and bring us the word. Well, thank you. Your check is in the mail for all those nice things you said about me. If you don't mind, turn with me to Luke chapter 15. And I just thank, I thank you all for allowing me to come this morning to, to bring God's word to you. And, and you guys are very fortunate to have Pastor Chris. And Pastor Chris is very fortunate to have you guys. You guys are a wonderful fit. And I am always appreciative to see a church that prays for its pastor. And so I appreciate just, just you all and your spirit and, and just the, the love and support that you give your pastors through and through. So I set out today with some, with some very ambitious goals. I haven't preached in a few months, and so if we're here for a few hours, that's why. Now nah, I'm playing. <laughs> I'm going to be fairly quick, maybe. Um, I set out today as I have... Um, over the past few months, just I've been one of those people that pastors should tell you not to be. I've been kind of a church hopper. I've gone to several different churches the past few months, and I've come to the conclusion <coughs> that there are some very dangerous people that preach on Sunday mornings. I, I went to a church a few weeks ago, and I was, I was listening to a message that had nothing inherently evil in it at all. But it was more fitting for a TED Talk, for an academic, self-help, motivating lecture than it would be for a gathering of God's people that would come together to worship the majesty of God and, and salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. I was greatly convicted as I, as I sat there and listened to, to folks have emotional ups and downs based on a, a man's cadence and tone of voice. It was... Um, I watched a guy tell what his congregation was trained to, to tell as a joke by his tone of voice, and I, I kind of sit there like, wow, this is the one man in the world that I might be funnier than. And so my, my heart's conviction and one of my prayerful goals that I've, that I've set out for today, which, which I think it's already been accomplished before I get here, knowing your pastor like I do, is that we all would have the conviction to read, God, to read God's Word for what God's Word is and to add nothing to and to remove nothing from that Word. I picked the prodigal of the lost son, which, by the way, if and, and you all do know, if the Bible was written and God didn't write the little chapter headings above it. That was something we did to try to make it more, more easily readable. They picked the worst title for this section ever in the, the parable of the prodigal son. or, or My Bible actually says the parable of, of the lost son. I, I argue both sons are lost, but we'll get there in a little bit. And I realized as I prepared for today that you've already heard this message because where I got most of my material from was your homecoming last year when Pastor Chris preached it. And so if you're thinking this morning... This sounds familiar. It might be. And I would just encourage you all, but before I begin and really just jump into the Word, that, that there are many people that, that I preach to, that I, that I see and I interact with, that, that have a couple different things on their mind on Sunday mornings. There are those of you in here that are the backbone of the church, and you're constantly working. You've got something to do to open the doors, to close the doors, to get ready for this, that, or the other. You've got something going on where the, the machine that is church just consumes you. I would ask you just for a few moments to do what would seem like it's impossible. Take a big, deep breath and let that go and just worship God this morning. There may be a few of you here this morning that would say, I've already heard the story of the prodigal son at least four dozen times. I'm an expert on the story of the prodigal son. I could recite it to you from memory. And while you might be, our goal this morning is to interact with God's Word in a, in a life-changing way. So to believe you're an expert on something would actually not even be the point at all in what we're doing this morning. But my prayer this morning is that we meet with God, that we find two things. 
great conviction where we need to repent of sin, and great joy in God's love for us. Amen? So let's get started. One time, Chris and I um, preached together with five other guys at this um, service, the Seven Sayings of the Savior on the Cross Easter sermon. And for about two months, I harassed he and the other guys about sticking within their parameters and their time frame of seven minutes. And if you combine three of them, you get close to the length of time that I preached, which was somewhere along the lines of 25 minutes. Um, that has nothing to do with my sermon. I just thought about that as I came up here and preached. The Chris probably thinks I'm going to preach for two hours. But I'm, I'm going to hopefully not. What I'd like to do is I would like to start and just read the passage to you. I don't have any cute alliteration. I don't have any cute boards to draw. I don't have any of that stuff for you this morning. I want to read you the passage, the story of the prodigal son. I'm going to leave out the previous two short parables that go hand in hand with it, with the idea that maybe I can give you a summary right here, that God rejoices when that which is lost is found. That God rejoices when that which is lost is found. I'm going to read this passage to you, and then I just want to walk through it. I want to paint a picture to you of a lost son, a lost son, and a great mighty father. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. He also said, and he is Jesus, by the way, just in case you're not sure who's speaking here. A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me a share of the estate that I have coming to me. So the father distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his entire inheritance in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to work to feed the pigs. Before I read any further, I want to put in your mind the picture of a young Jewish man having to go work with the pigs to make a living to be able to eat and how humiliating that might be. It paints the picture of the desperation in this man's life. So let's pick back up in verse 16. He longed to eat his fill from the care of peas the pigs were eating. He wanted to eat what they were eating because he was so hungry. But no one would give him any. It's hard to fight a pig in a pig trough to get something. Verse 17. When he came to his census, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food, and I am here dying of hunger? <coughs> I'm going to get up, go to my father, and I'm going to say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. So he got up and he went to his father. And while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him, and was filled with great compassion. He ran, he threw his arms around his son's neck, and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and I have sinned in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robes and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and then bring the fattened calf. And slaughter it. We're going to celebrate it with a great feast. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive once more. He was lost and now is found. So they began to celebrate. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants and asked what all of these things meant. The servant answered and said, your brother is here. And your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has come back safe and sound. Then his older brother became angry and did not want to go inside. So the father came out and pleaded with him. And he replied to his father, Look, I've been slaving many years for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes. You slaughtered the fattened calf for him. In verse 31, Son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours 
was dead and is now alive again. He was lost and now is found. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God in heaven, we love you and we thank you for today. God, I thank you for these people. And God, I thank you for Pastor Chris. And, and I pray for, for Pastor Chris and his family that they, as they have become a family of nine, that you would just give them great encouragement. God, that this group, this body of believers would come around them with love and, and great respect. And God, right now in this moment, no matter what our thing is that keeps us from worshiping you, may you rip that from us. God, would you break us this morning so we can look high and see the glory that you have. God, would today be a, a mighty revelation for us to serve and to look like Christ more than we ever have before. In the name of Christ, I pray. In the name of Christ, we do all things this morning. Amen. In my endeavors around churches and just listening to lots of sermons, I, I've heard this passage preached in a number of ways. And, and one of my least favorite ways I hear it preached is one of the most often ways I hear it preached. And that is to take this story and to, to modernize it in, in terms of like a, like a dad that owns a business and some sons. I want, I want to give something away to you. You know, Jesus spoke in parables. But we don't have the right to make up our own parables because we're not Jesus. You don't see those that come after him in the scriptures create their own parables. They cite his parables and they just lay out that Jesus Christ is the one who has died and risen again. This parable is not about a business owner. This parable is not about an earthly family. The spiritual meaning in this parable is that it is God's relationship to lost people. Let's walk through this. And first we'll look in this passage that you were all very familiar with. At the circumstances regarding the younger son. The younger son... I can probably relate to more in, in a sense at a different time in my life because when I was a little younger, even shortly after I became a Christian, I was the one that wanted to just go and to party. I'm a, um, it, it's called sensation seeking personality. I always want to try the new thing. I'll, I'll ride the biggest roller coaster and I'll, I'll go and do the most spontaneous trip or I, I jumped off the roof of a church one time just playing a game. This younger son went to his father and said, I want my inheritance. Now, if any of you have ever had an inheritance, do you know when that typically comes? After the death of that person. That had to be just, just striking to those that were listening to this parable. And, and by the way, the ones listening to this parable right now, if you were to back up a few verses, it would say all of the tax collectors and sinners were approaching and listening to Jesus. So this message, while there are Pharisees around because there are people questioning him, the group broadens. And it is though Jesus in this is saying, I have the right to speak to these folks that are not the Pharisees. I have the right to speak to these folks that are not devout Jews because of this. And so we see the younger son. Let me get back on track. And he demands his inheritance. And his father says, okay, you can have it. Gives him what would be due to him typically upon his father's death. And he goes and he squanders it. Anytime anybody gives me $10, I'm going to squander it pretty quickly at McDonald's. I can't imagine what it would be like to be given a huge and a great inheritance like what is probably described here. But... I would point out to you first, and I'm, I'm not a good pastor to take notes to because I don't have great alliterative points. I don't, I don't go point A, point B, point C. But I would point out one thing to you here and a few other things as we go. The consequence of sin is great. And I mean great as in big, not great as in good. The consequences of sin are real. Yes, Jesus can and will forgive you of those sins. But the consequences might remain and reverberate for a very long time on this side of eternity. The consequence of this man going and squandering his inheritance wasn't immediately 
going to be resolved. He was in a place of despair. The consequence of sin is real. And not just some sin. Not just those sexual sins. Not just those sins of, of, of close relationships. But the consequence of sin is real. Whether it be gossip in the church, gossip at your workplace, whether it be the sin of idolatry, the sin of, of sinful pride that I deal with so often, the echo of that sin reverberates out way further than, than we would be willing to admit and way more than we could ever realize. Younger son squandered his property on reckless living. And then it just so happened when he spent everything, there was also a severe famine in the very country that he ran off to. So think about this picture. The guy shows up to a town, to a city. He ran far away from his father like, like many in the Bible would do, run away from God. He ran far from his father. He went somewhere with a ton of money. He went somewhere with a ton of stuff. And he lost all of it. He squandered it all. And at the same time, a famine occurred in the same place. So there was no means for him to find benevolence. It wasn't like he could have walked up to a group of people and said, Hey, God, are doing good. Let me get some extra. Nobody had any extra to give him. So he was in a place where he was scraping the bottom <coughs> of the barrel. He went from living a life on high as though he were almost a prince, from what I can gather from this text. He had, he had lots of stuff. He had servants. He lived a great life. And he decided... I think I can do better on my own. I think I can do better on my own, so I'm going to take what's mine, I'm going to go out, and I'm going to have a wonderful time, and I'm going to do better and have more fun out on my own. However, when we run from God, the consequences of the sin that are adjacent to that, they're real. So when he went and he found a job, and like I said before, he found a job as a Jewish person, most likely. Working for pigs. Working to feed pigs. And he was so hungry, he wanted the pig's food, but no one would give him the pig's food. Can you imagine being so hungry that you want the stuff you're feeding the livestock, yet you're told you can't have it? So you watch the animals eat, and you're told specifically you're not allowed to to eat that food. And in that, in that moment of despair, said in verse 17, he came to his senses. I think back to, to different people that encountered God Almighty in the Bible. From Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, who had that mighty revelation of God on the throne to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were in the burning fire with a fourth shadow to Paul on the road to Damascus who has a direct encounter with Jesus. I think of the disciples who were fairly unclear as to who this man was even as they traveled in its midst. I think of my life and, and my, my conversion to Christianity and there comes a moment when you just can't run anymore. When you know that you can't get any, you can't go any lower. And unfortunately, that's how God, or fortunately, that's how God works in our weaknesses, in our despair, in our problems, in our heartache. Sometimes that's what it takes for stubborn fools like me to look up and see the glory of God's hand in it all. This man had hit the bottom of the bottoms, and he might have not just scraped the bottom of the barrel, but the bottom of the barrel might have very well been rusty, and he fell right through the bottom of it, right into the sludge. But then he came to his senses. What does it mean to come to your senses biblically? What does it mean to run away from your father and to come to your senses? Because I'm not talking about family issues. I'm talking about things of a spiritual nature. I believe that the young son here was beginning to exhibit the word repentance. That he saw that his ways were not the right way, but yet the father's ways were the right ways. Because in this, in this section here, the 17 through 21 aspect here, it says, 
How many of my father's hands would have more than enough food, but I'm here dying for hunger? That statement by itself seems selfish, but listen to the rest of it again. I think I'm going to get up. I'm going to go to my father, and I'm going to say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired hands. The young son who knows he is heir to this man everything. He might have gotten his inheritance, but he knows he should still be welcomed back into the house with the position he left. He said, I don't, I don't want that. I want, to, I want to earn my way back. I, I just want to be there near my father. I'm okay with if I have to start from scratch. I'm okay if I have to start over again. I'm okay is if as I've fallen through the bottom of the barrel, if I have to crawl back up into the barrel and find my way up the sides to get out of this. I'm okay with that as long as I can go and be back near him. He also recognized who he sinned against. His father. If you want to talk about repentance and you talk about a, a global understanding of the majesty of God and the lowliness that we have apart from Jesus. You see it again with Isaiah when he said, Woe is me, for I am a sinner with unclean lips. You see it in the prayer of Hezekiah in Isaiah chapter 37 when he is about to be destroyed. His, the entire kingdom is going to be destroyed possibly by the Ninevites except for the mighty hand of God. And in that time of calamity and confusion, Hezekiah lifted up a prayer to heaven and he said, Lord our God, save us from this power so that all of the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are God and you alone are God. So here's the similarity with the younger son, those that I mentioned, and any Bible character that you teach in the Old Testament and Sunday school class with children. They acknowledged their dependence upon God. They acknowledged that they needed to go back to the Father. And if you're going to tune me out in a minute, I need to tell you the end so you can go and take your nap for the rest of my sermon. We can't work our way back to the Father, but we'll get there in a second. But in the story of the younger son, we can all resonate and relate, right? But this is how most of the time we do it. Oh, I know someone in my family who has gone prodigal. Your son, your daughter, your spouse, your, your cousin, your co-worker, they run from the faith. So this message should be for them. You might say, God, why aren't they here listening to this? They need to hear this this morning. They need to come back. Those people need to hear this message. And you know, there's, there's a hint of, of sarcasm in my voice at that because I am going to point all of us back to ourselves and our standing with God. But I would say that it is healthy and just our nature to be worried sick about those that we love dearly that have run from the faith. And that's why we pray for them. That's why we earnestly seek them and love them and, and have community with them and invite them back into the fold over and over and over again. There are many that we would worry about. I, I have my own relatives that, that I would be consumed with. And here's the good news. We see in this passage that I read a little while ago that the father didn't say, okay, well, here's your uniform. You keep tending after my pig. He said, quit. Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is now alive again. He is lost and is found, so now we celebrate. Let's say that you were to get mad at me or Chris and I as, as good friends that would get mad at each other and let's say I like, pop them in the mouth and say I'm not going to talk to you again, I'll catch you in a while and then I come back and I say hey let, let's be buds again I don't think he's going to let me wear his coat and make the best steaks in his house for me but the father and in this parable I can't stress enough that there's only one father who can represent and that's, that's God Almighty our, our father in heaven Recognized the sinfulness of his son. Also recognized the willingness of repentance in his son. And took him back and maybe put him in a position higher than he had ever been before. So we see the love of the father that you cannot run from God. 
the story of Jonah. Jonah thought he was running from God, right? He thought he was going where God didn't want him to go. But the entire time, you see the hand of God right underneath it all. Whenever Jonah set out to run away from Nineveh and went to another city, God already knew where he was going. God was preparing him. When he got on that boat and the storm happened, and he said to the sailors, hey, this weird thing where it's obvious that someone above us, some God above us is punishing me, that one might be on me. He was thrown into the belly of the big fish. God's hand was all over it because the big fish just so happened to spit him out right where he had been running from, right at the base of Nineveh. But friend, if you're running from the Lord today, I have to tell you, you can't hide from God. I also would like to tell you, you shouldn't run from God. You don't need to run from God. God wants to grant you, God wants to give you a repentant heart, and God will. God's love is indescribably great. It's enormous, and we can't see how big God's love is until we see ourselves for the sinner that we really are. The word prodigal, by the way, just so we're clear, it, it's almost changed meaning because of the title of this parable from the King James Bible. Because prodigal, for the most part, has always meant just lavish and huge and unnecessarily big and great. So the only prodigal love, the only prodigal thing here is the father's lavish and great, overwhelming love for his children. We, we've changed the word to mean something a little different, but if we're looking at extremely generous and lavish, the only one that is that definition is the father. And I'm going to be honest with you. I kind of wish the parable would have ended there. And if I were there and I were one of the, um, the non-tax collectors and what I thought was a non-sinner around Jesus, I might have elbowed him at that point and been like, all right, bro, that's enough. Stop. Don't want to hear it anymore because they could probably see Jesus. And they probably knew by now that Jesus wasn't going to stop with just half the people he was talking to. So the story did keep going. And then we see that the elder brother who has always been meant to represent the old time Baptist church member actually I'm sorry I didn't mean that he's supposed to represent the Pharisee he's supposed to represent the older brothers to represent the one that has always had the religious access the one that's always done the things like wore the word of scriptures on their arm and what they call phylacteries always looked the right way, always said the right thing and did the right thing, always had the right prayer request, always voiced the right stuff. But you know what I've come to learn? There are a lot of these elder brothers that would put on the right act. They would say the right thing. But then if you catch them at the right moment, the poison in their hearts would be shown and shown clearly. This elder brother who should have been happy that his brother had come home was upset. He was pretty angry as far as I can tell in this that his brother had come home. He was so angry in fact, and it might be a little nuanced, he might not have caught it. He didn't say that brother of mine showed back up. He said that son of yours came back as though he had disowned the younger brother when the father had not disowned that son himself. The father reminds the older brother of that in that very last sentence in this passage when he said, your brother has returned. Older brothers, according to um, a, great, a great theologian that I read, I just stuck his quote right here in the middle of my sermon, elder brothers can be lethal. Imagine what would have happened had he encountered his brother first when he came back as the wayward son. The elder brother might have said something like, so you've come back. I see things didn't work out quite how you thought. I told you so. Too bad. Maybe, maybe little brother, you picked the wrong time to come back. Why don't you keep working hard in the pig fields over there and you come back and when you get your life right and you're a little more respectable, maybe then we'll let you go and talk to dad. 
Or better yet, I'll add to that. Hey, you keep working in the fields, and I'm going to work with you. And I'm going to show you how I do things. And all you got to do is look like me. Do the things that I do. Walk like me, talk like me, act like me, and then we'll take you before the Father. The mentality of the older brother is deadly to the church. The older brother was saying what what would sound fair in a lot of ways. Why does he get more than I get when I've been right under your nose the whole time? Jesus addressed this in his Sermon on the Mount in a lengthy way. (coughs) Jesus went through every commandment. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not steal. And what did he do? He went deeper. He went to the spiritual level of each of the Ten Commandments and said, you might say this, but I'm going to actually make it more strict and tell you that if the condition of your heart is such that you would even want those things to happen or you think those things, you have sinned. I think we're seeing the same situation here, that we're going deeper. That the older brother, when he says, I deserved all of these things, his his sinful heart is just overflowing. So it doesn't make sense all the time why God shows favor to some and not others. I'm going to be honest with you. But it doesn't have to. Because God is God. But just because you act the right way or you show up to the right place on Sunday doesn't necessarily make you closer to God. This is what I've, I've come to learn through this passage. By the way, just an aside. How did the older brother know that the younger brother had been with prostitutes who squandered his money? One theologian says that the older brother is a, a peep in time. One would probably be a little more um, diplomatic with it and just said that he was keeping tabs on his little brother and never tried to intervene in help. Either way, the older brother's heart is exposed in all of this. So you know what it means? That sometimes, many times, the one that stays right under the things of God, the one that stays right in the building, the one that that studies the Scriptures fervently, can be just as far away from the Father as the one who just runs his heart out. The one that stays right there on the farm can be just as far away spiritually from the Father as the one who has run and run and run and tried to escape that very same Father. St. Augustine put it this way. For it is not by our feet, nor by change of place, that we either turn to God or from God. In darkened affection lies the distance from God's face. The young man had been far from the father in the distant country because of the sins of passion and the sins of, of prideful idolatry. But the elder son was separated from his father through the sins of his attitude. And R. Kent Hughes would say this, the older son, I believe, was even farther away from his younger brother even though he had never left the house. Let that sink in for a moment. We love to hear sermons on Sunday about those people, right? We like to hear our amen rallying cries about the lost and dying world. They need to do better. Well, how in the world can we expect them to do better apart from Jesus? My expectation is not that those that don't know Christ would act in some certain moralistic way. My expectation is that we that know Christ would be the loving light of the gospel. Sometimes that's being really sugary, sweet, nice, and sometimes that's just being honest. So I am not giving you a pass to go out and tell people that they can continue to sin. I'm telling you that we need to be the light of the gospel that neither the younger brother or the older brother are. Whether it be in the church or out of the church, there are those that need to hear the gospel. Billy Graham has has a great outlook into this when he said that he believed that based on on some of the things that Jesus said that usually half of his audience, even if it was a a full church audience and not an evangelistic crusade, could possibly live apart from Christ because some of the words that Jesus uses when he talks about 
those that would be cast apart from him when he said, turn away from me for I never knew you, would be talking about the vast majority. Not just the, the scant handful that missed the gospel, but the great number of people who don't get the gospel that think that they did. But we see the Father's love again. As I kind of round for home to finish this up this morning, we see the jerky older brother say, why are you doing all this for him? I'm the one that stayed here in labor. And God says, son, you were always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is now alive again. He was lost and is found. And if we can't rejoice over that, we need to get right with God. If we can't find a way to be happy whenever, whenever others succeed in Christian ministry, we got to get right. When we can't see that whatever sin is going on in someone's lives around us and our neighbors, it doesn't preclude them from being able to be changed by the gospel. It's like saying that God can't save or that, that you get to tell God whom He has predestined to save, however you want to look at it. It's like saying that we actively have played a role, some part in it, and we have not We try to speak for God and we can't. And we miss His great love for us because whether it was the wayward son that stayed home or the wayward son that was far away, the Father loved them both the same. The father chased the older son in this statement much like he chased the younger son who had drifted away. And this parable is, in probably the most appropriate way, we don't know how the older son was father. <laughs> the truth is that the younger son was right in his statement when he came home. He had sinned against his father. He had sinned against his father. And he wasn't worthy of to be brought back into his father's family. He wasn't. Bottom line is he had disqualified himself. His punishment should have been working in those fields, feeding the pigs, and starving, whether it be to death or by disease that would come from that malnutrition. That was the life he laid out for himself. He gave all of that up. He was dead and bound for a really, really tough life. But when the younger brother came to his senses and repented, and he saw the greatness of his father, his father restored him back into a better standing than he had been in before, and there was nothing the younger son could have ever done to get back into that right standing. You remember that part that I read about when the celebration started, the father said, go and put on the best robe in the house around my son. You know who has the best robe in the house, right? His dad. He said, go and put my robe around him. Think about that for just a minute. It's great and wise father. Hey, this is, my, this is my best thing here. Take it. Go put this around him. Tell him that's how much we love. Tell him that's how much we miss him. Tell him that's how much it means to see where you are apart from me. And in that same way, the Gospel says that when we see Jesus, when we see Jesus for who He is, the one, not just the speaker of this parable, but the Savior of the world, when we see Him for who He is, we see ourselves for who we are, and we repent and say that we need to come home because we have sinned in the eyes of God, and we see that Jesus died in our place for our sins according to the Scriptures. God does to us what this father did for his son and that we get his best clothes. We get to be clothed in the righteousness of God. And when all things are said and done and we, we come before judgment, we don't get judged in light of ourselves. Oh, because the punishment of being judged in light of ourselves is damnation. We get judged in light of Jesus. Both the older son and the younger son of this parable had to be confronted with that. That the one that knew best was the father. How would you respond to God's great love this morning? Would you be willing to, to pray for those that you know have gone wayward? 
Would you go a step further and be willing to say, God, I don't want to be that older son. I don't want to be the eldest one in this in this story. I don't want to be the one that's pious. I don't want to be the one that looks religious but doesn't get it. Would you not just pray for those that are wayward, but pray that God would continue to break you and rebuild you more and more like Jesus every single day? Would you do both of those things? Would you pray for your church and your pastor and your community? Would you be willing to say that every time I open the Bible, I don't want to prove a point, I don't want to feel better about myself, but I want to encounter God Almighty in such a way that it would convict me and help me to find joy at the same time, but lead me to live a life that would be one that would be that of the gospel being. Maybe you're here this morning and you're realizing that you're a lot more wayward than you've ever let on. That you fooled your way all the way into church leadership, you fooled your way all the way into to be that family member that everyone would think would be the, the most religious. Maybe this morning would be your wonderful weight off of the world off your shoulders and say, I'm not. I sinned against the Father and I need to repent. This is what I know. I know that when we repent, genuinely, and we call upon the name of Jesus genuinely with eyes of faith open in the way that only God can open them that God changes lives don't give up hope for those that have gone wayward but don't be so blind to yourself that you forget that you are also a work in progress would you be willing to pray for those things this morning as we as we respond in, in whatever way that, that your pastors would, would want us to respond this morning, I, I won't take away his, his privilege of, of giving you all an invitation or some way to respond in some way, shape, or form, but would you do those things? Would you be willing to see God for who He is, the great need for a Savior that we all have, and you'd be willing to take the name of that Savior with you to tell the world that Jesus, I'm great here.